Yeah. Hi, guys. I'm, I've, I've, to make things more complicated, I've actually moved away from London to Melbourne, so technically inaccurate, but only by about two weeks. So, never mind. I like to travel. Okay, so, um, what I want to... If this works... I want to talk to you a little bit about what the world was like when I started developing web apps. That's where my background is, is in. Um, and when we were, when, you know, way back then, I won't tell you how long ago it was, um, we were mainly concerned with this thing here, this, this web app. Now, okay, sure, we'd make some HTML, we'd send it to the browser, and we might try and get some application state and put it into a database over there. But really, the web app was where the exciting stuff happened. And, okay, sure, we sometimes had to talk to other systems, we didn't act in isolation, but, you know, that was kind of like a side concern. You know, we might have to talk to a web service or maybe something putting data into our database. Um, but over the last few, few years, and, um, I've noticed, obviously, there's been a bit of a change. So one is this rise and rise of JavaScript. I mean, JavaScript used to be like how you used to, used to do pop-ups and client-side form validation. Uh, yeah, times have changed. Um, also, stuff which should, shouldn't, we shouldn't have had to have discovered along the way, but has, we have discovered for, you know, for, for the better. Stuff like logging, metrics, monitoring, dashboards, just understanding what's going on in your site. And with that's come a lot of kind of stuff as a service. You're talking to a lot more systems than you were in the, in, in the past. Uh, alongside that as well, there's this kind of move to avoid this monolithic, monolith application that does everything and start to move to kind of smaller um, parts and services for, for right or for wrong. But there's, a, you know, there's this shift from big web app to big system. So, it, you know, we, it actually becomes more helpful to talk about my job to define the thing I concentrate on as not being this web app, this piece of Java code or C sharp code or, or, or whatever, um, to actually talking about building systems that talk to our, you know, this, this sort of series of connected components for some def definition of the word connected. Uh, and these systems, they sit within other systems, they talk to other systems, they talk to other systems, and so on and so forth, all the way up the stack, until, well, you kind of, I guess, get the internet. Um, but what I'm, what I'm interested in, and, when, and, and what kind of what I mean when I talk about web integration, um, is what's holding all these systems and all these different bits and components together. So instead of talking about the boxes in our architecture diagram, um, I'm talking, I want to talk about the lines. What, what are these, what is this stuff that we're using to communicate backwards and forwards? Um, and it's kind of, it's kind of strings, isn't it? In, in a lot of cases, okay, you know, let's, let's argue that one later. It was just a clever talk title to kind of, you know, make it sound interesting. But, you know, it's kind of true. You know, we, we, we're, we're building these web applications and we're sitting on top of, um, like, the internet stack, as, as I guess you'd call it. Um, and we're dealing, there's these various levels of layers of protocols, but where we come in is at this application level. And at the application protocol level, quite a lot of those protocols, they're, they're, they're text-based. Um, um, you know, what do I mean by that? Well, it's, you send some strings, you get some strings back. So, just sitting there, sending strings backwards and forwards. And it's kind of cool, because it's kind of transparent. We can, we know what's going on as, as much as um, the program that we write to interpret it. So, you know, we can, we can access this stuff and type in commands and check our email via telnet and stuff like that. Um, and, of course, the most common application protocol, certainly in my world, we could argue, and it, I couldn't actually find any hard statistics about this. Um, the, most, the most common is HTTP. Um, so, that includes lots of things. There's sort of media types, content negotiation, you know, you can decide what format you want to send your stuff in, uh, define a, defines a common set of verbs, uh, support for caching, coding, authentication, lots and lots and lots. The, the HTTP spec is quite big. Um, but what I want to focus on is that request and response, the, that, the whole structure of the way the messages work. I, you know, so HTTP request, you send over there, and you get HTTP response back. So, starting from first principles, what, what does that do to our kind of messaging uh, in, uh, like exchange. So we could start rather naively with a custom protocol, and um, 
I'd say we've all done this, it's quite fun to do. You, you know, sit and write some stuff directly to a socket and read some stuff back off. Um, you, you invent your own error checking and, and recovery and stuff like that. Um, and you're kind of working with your own libraries. As soon as you add HTTP, you've kind, of, you've kind of had a bit of that stuff taken away from you. You don't have to do as much work. Um, for example, like addressing, saying, I want to get the cities from Bob's Weather Service. Um, and there's a kind of standard way of returning, returning back the response. Um, that's standard, again, so we can read it and understand it. It's not, it's not anything language specific. It's not anything library specific. But there are libraries available to do that. You know, in Clojure, we have Ring and Clojure HTTP that allow us to talk HTTP. And step three, we can enhance that. And we can start to use more standardized content types, of which there are many available, as we heard earlier. Um, 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 whichever one you choose, for whichever reason, most of them have this benefit that there are libraries, again, there are libraries available for them, like w whether they're self-describing or not, whether they're particularly optimal for what you're trying to do, it's a standard format. So once you've got this data in JSON, there's a library I can use in my application to read it. So that's cool. So HTTP content types, and they give us this kind of common language for message interchange, get, put, post, and things like that, um, and also a way, a, a common language for the message contents as well. So if we're talking about this scenario where we've got two applications talking to one another, they're, they're integrating, is that enough? Is that enough for us to effectively do our jobs? Well, kind of. So let's take the scenario. This is, what I'm, this is the structure of the message I'm expecting back from Bob's weather service. Um, it's got a name, a temperature, and it's got an outlook for today and tomorrow. You can see why I moved out of London. Um, <laughs> but that's, that's, you know, that's fun. I've, I've written my program to expect that. I, I read out today's outlook and I put it on a big screen. Um, but there's nothing guaranteeing. I've deployed my application. It's sitting out there on the, the wild west of the internet running. There's nothing to guarantee that Bob's weather service isn't going to start instead send me a picture of, uh, of a cat. There's, you know, and what do I do at that point? Do I, you know, I have to kind of like code for all these scenarios and write all this elaborate guard code to make sure, you know, that I'm getting what I expect. Um, and, and that's, it's not just the messages, the content of the messages where stuff can go wrong. Um, we've also got this problem that resources can change, like addresses might, you know, I might have been able to access before, return 200, now return a 404 or 402 or whatever that one is about making a couple, uh, for the, the I'm a teapot protocol, I forget which, which status code that was. But yeah, the point is that stuff can change and shift under our feet. Um, and, and, and why this is, is well, HTTP gives us this common language, it gives us this protocol, but it doesn't, it doesn't allow us to describe our expectations. So we, we, there's no way of saying these resources are available, these operations are available, this is kind of what the message looks like, or this is kind of what I expect the message to look like, and we want these status codes. So number one, we can't describe that. There's no language to describe that within HTTP. Um, and there's no way of checking that that's actually the case, of verifying that. Um, and I'd just like to say, obviously, nor, nor should there be. HTTP is not really meant for that. Um, but because we don't really, there's not really a good way to do that, we end up with this kind of slightly crappy state where there's still these ambiguities and untested paths. Because, you know, if you're, like, if, if you're writing an app that's consuming another web service and taking something, taking something from that and pushing it out to somewhere else and putting it into a database, if, if something goes wrong in one of those messages, you could end up with this kind of garbage in, garbage out effect and then just garbage flowing through the whole system. You end up in this kind of weird, weird path. And, you know, you have to write a lot of guard code to stop that from happening. Um, you also have to have, like, a lot of trust in the service providers to do the right thing. So you've got to trust them to migrate, you know, not, you know, to provide backwards compatible versions of stuff, to not suddenly disappear things without telling you. Um, and in most of these cases, because it is this request and response thing, the consumer, the one making the request, is generally the one that suffers at the end of the day if something goes wrong. Um, and even if you are kind of a conscientious um, service provider, um, upgrades are just kind of a bit of a pain because you, you don't know. You've got all these consumers sitting out here. You're not entirely sure which of them are using 
which parts of your message or which are using which operations. So even if you want to do the right thing, change is really hard. Um, and obviously we're, 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 not, we're not stupid or you know, we, we try and do our jobs. We do try and address these problems and try and attack the sort of ambiguity thing. Uh, one way we do that is uh, by distributing client libraries. So if you uh, are writing a service, you might alongside it write a client library in Java or something and, 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 and distribute that out to your clients and say, hey guys, I know it's not clear what our service does, but you, know, you just use these methods on here and it'll be fine. And that is fine until stuff kind of goes wrong. They upgrade things and you've got to up before to upgrade your library. And it's also, you know, you're coupled to this, this service because you're, you know, you're in, in, in a way, because you're using it, but then you're also kind of relying on them to write your client code for you as well. Not always a good situation. Um, there's also a platform problem as well. If there's no implementation for your platform, you're kind of screwed. Um, there's also automated contract tests, which is, is kind of a good way of flushing some of this out. So, you know, you, you write a series of automated tests that check, check that the service is doing what you expect. And that works, but they're kind of a pain to maintain. And they're also, you know, people say test as documentation. Sure, you know, it kind of works, but you're kind of sk skating around the edge of defining this contract by writing a bunch of tests. And I don't know, it doesn't, to me, it seems like it's solving half a problem, but not quite there. Um, and we, we can also solve it uh, by ourselves using people. Um, which is things like consuming API documentation. Um, so me, as a person who should be doing better things, can be like going and reading some documentation online and figuring out exactly what status codes are going to come back from this thing and what I should do in each case. Um, and then if there's no API documentation, we have informal chats, email, a lot of trust and maybe some crossed fingers. You know, it's, it's kind of, doesn't, it doesn't feel that safe. Um, and uh, uh, to me, the problem is that we have this thing here. We have these like, implicit contracts. I, I, uh, if I'm writing a consumer application, there are certain things I depend on on that service. We might not highlight them. We might not bring them to the front, but there's a list of things I expect you know, this URL to return this status code, to return messages that look like this. There is something there. It's just maybe it's not really very apparent. Um, and one thing, one problem, I, one way I think we can solve that is moving to maybe more explicit contracts. And, and some more useful contracts too. To, you know, we, once, once you've brought these things out and you've made them real, you've sort of documented the operations, uh, messages in a machine readable way. Um, you can use them for verification, monitoring, documentation, all sorts of things. You can make these things useful. But I kind of feel like we may have been here before. Um, I don't know if this sounds a bit familiar to anybody. Um, and the reason it's familiar is that I maybe missed a slide off my um, initial brief history of web app dev as, as told by me, um, which was, how did, we, how did we do it back then? In this old, you know, how did, how did we manage to integrate with other systems? Um, and okay, so there's lots of technologies we used. But one of the ones we used certainly when I was, I was doing it was one of these. And yeah, um, yeah, like you can, yeah, boo, hiss, come on, come on. All right, I feel your pain, guys. Come on, come on, let's let it out. It's all right, it's going to be fine. Um, yeah, so what, what was this doing? Let, let, let's just take a step back from the kind of the pain we all feel. Um, but it, it was kind of doing what I said. It, we, we're defining an interface. Uh, we're defining the things that can go wrong of, in, of a fashion. We're defining the, kind, the shape of the messages that go in, shape of the messages go back. And, well, you know, we kind of, gonna, you know, we, 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 we've got all those things that we didn't have in, in this kind of world I'm describing. Um, we also had its friend, its com kind of complementary XML format, um, so XSD is there to describe exactly the format of every message that you're going to send to the letter um, with no, no ambiguities, no nothing. Um, your XML's only gonna look like that, and that's it. Um, and like I say, it kind of, just, just bear with me here, right? It, it kind of, 
it kind of did what I said. What I, what I said was kind of missing. It described the operations and the messages being passed back and forth. We had tools to validate this stuff was being, like that these things were being met. Well, actually, we didn't have tools. Our, our, our applications would stop working if like, he upgraded the wizard. You know, you know, that's, to me, kind of <coughs> validating it. <laughs> um, but um, obviously, at a, a, a kind of a major expense, which is why everyone's laughing. In, in, you know, it's, it was kind of painful. So there's the high coupling effect. So your, your service had 20 operations that it broadcast on this interface. You had to know about all 20, even if you were just using one. Likewise, if it was returning a data type that had 20 fields on it and you only used three, you needed to know about all 20. As soon as, because you, if you're using that, X, that XSD to validate it, to, to check what was coming back, which most um, web services stuff kind of did, and you, you'd find in this case where if the service started to change that definition, added more stuff, you had to upgrade your, your client, which was no fun. Um, and because of that, that high coupling and this like really hard change, you know, it was really hard to change stuff, we'd end up with this like big upfront design of contracts. Even before the systems were written, you'd, you'd sit and decide what that interface was. And, and likewise with schemas. I mean, I, I, I can't believe like how many, in my, in my early stages of my career, how many kind of schema design meetings I sat through to design XML schemas, like between, between like parts of an organization or between different organizations. It was, yeah, that was a lot of fun. Um, any data format, as long as it's XML. So, you know, you're restricted to your data formats. Um, and for as much as I said that WSDL was giving us what, what we needed, it was normally generated. I don't remember hand editing WSDL unless one of the tools I was using had gone majorly wrong. You didn't, you didn't own that document. It wasn't yours to kind of play with and write tools off. You could, but it was a fairly impenetrable format. And it was WSDL too. That was, didn't help. So let's go back to HTTP integration now. Let's go back to the, the world that we live in now because we know so much more. But how can, we, how can we get smarter about that? How can, we, how can we tackle some of those problems that I've said with the ambiguities and not really know what's going on and making change hard? What can we do? So one thing that I think we could do is maybe have smarter contracts. Um, when I say smarter contracts, I, I'm, I'm not advocating going back to the dark days of wisdom, but please don't get me wrong. Um, what, what's a smarter contract? Because the, the problem is, like, there, there is a contract there. There, are, you know, there. there is something that you rely on. You're just kind of pretending it's not there. So can we just make, make these things explicit, make them real, and just get them to work a bit better? So what would be better would be flexibility. So you know, there's, a, it, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of things that we're doing. We don't always need to have that level of kind of control of what's going on, or what, what's coming back in, um, in a request and response. We, have, we want to be able to just apply them where, where necessary. Uh, Non-complete, which I don't think is quite the right word. What I mean is, though, is, is that kind of postal's law being liberal in what you receive. Um, and they've got to be a tool to be used for us, so they've got to be apl applicable pre, pre hoc? I don't know if that's really a word. Pre, -ho pre post, ad hoc. They, we've got to be able to, do, to create a contract for an existing service, or maybe create one before a service exists, or, or create one at a time just to debug and try and find out what the hell's going wrong with something. We've got to be able to use them in all, those, all, all the hocks. Um, we've got to have a, uh, we've got to have a, ch a choice of um, content types too. Like restricting yourself to a particular content type is just not useful. Like, you know, as, as kind of Stu's talk went on earlier, the, the, there's, a, the, the, there's actually some really interesting stuff happening there. I don't want to restrict um, myself to JSON or, or, or engine, even though that seems to be the most common thing right now. I don't want to restrict myself to it, like, just like we didn't want to restrict ourselves to XML. Um, and then yeah, it should be supporting tools that make our lives easier. Um, Wizzle just, you know, it felt like this kind of thing sort of constraining us and making things hard to change. I, I, I think we should have contracts that let us drive tools, like I say, testing, monitoring, stub generation. And I think they should come from the consumer where appropriate. I'll talk a little bit about that um, later. Um, but why closure? Why, why, am I, why am I talking about this now? Not, not least for the fact that we need it. We are working in this world of muddy integration and ambiguities. Um, but why, why, why is it something I think we could start to think about? Um, 
So I say data is a first-class citizen. I think I wrote that quite late last night. What I mean is that, that you've got this kind of these structures that are readable from whatever format you choose. Um, they're readable as a human. Um, they're, they're also, you can transform them. They're extensible. They're, you know, the, a, a map, you don't have to think about every single key in a map. You can just look at the stuff you're interested in. Uh, transmittable. I think I just meant you can go and save that to a data format and go and send it off somewhere else. And someone else can read it. They're not necessarily um, in closure, but they, they, we, can, we can write to shared data formats. And we also have libraries that integrate well together. So, so a lot of these things are going to be around looking at HTTP and looking at different data formats. And we've actually got this huge, a huge advantage because our kind of integrating libraries in Clojure is a case of taking some data structures from here and putting them over the hair. Um, it makes things remarkable. If you compare it to other kind of frameworky approaches, it makes it really easy to say, take Liberator, which I think is going to be mentioned at some point in the conference, taking, taking a Liberator resource and plugging it into Ring just, just kind of works. It's just flying maps around. Um, so it makes it really easy to start to combine these tools in interesting ways. Um, I want to say interesting ways. I think there's some really dangerously good ideas around testing and verification going on. Um, so I've got the generative testing. Um, Heard of that sort of similar, we were talking about it last night actually, sort of similar to the Haskell quick check idea. It's this whole idea around property based testing. Um, uh, simulant, um, and for kind of, that's around like testing, sim like running simulations across your system, right? Um, schema, which again I think has been talked about later, um, around like testing that your data is, is in a particular shape, I think is the way that works. And then this kind of really quite interesting experimentation around typing. Um, like, it, it, it's me, to me, it's really interesting that we could start to use, we start to use typing rather, you know, start to apply types to things and be a consumer of typing rather than having it enforced on us by the language we're trying to use. I think that's just quite an interesting idea around verification there. Um, and then I just wanted to add one more idea in, uh, which is this library myself and a colleague have been working on um, called Janus. So yeah, the kind of central idea of Janus is if you can represent your contract as data, we can make tools to do useful stuff with it. Like I said, verification, monitoring, documentation, and then this whole idea of sub-generation. When I say that, I mean actually using that contract to create a version, a sort of safe, disconnected version of the service. Um, just a note, just in case anyone wanted some history lessons. Uh, Janus is the, yes, the Roman god of doors, gates, trades, beginnings and endings, um, and lots of other stuff, and maybe web integration too. Uh, he's, he's kind of depicted often as this, uh, this god looking that way and looking that way. And if you think about something that's providing a way of using contracts to verify upstream services and also to support other, to, to you know, test the consumer, he's kind of quite a good mascot. I thought it was quite a clever name, I didn't come up with it. So I'm just going to show you, or try to show you, wish me luck here, um, a quick wee demo of the kind of, the, the kind of things I'm talking about. Um, so what we do, we're going to start with, I've created a little web service here. It doesn't do very much. It tells me the temperature in three cities I've been in recently. Um, and those readings are changing every so often as well. So it's taking supposedly live data and um, broadcasting it and, and it, up, updating its internal state. So that's what, that's, what the, that's what the web service I'm interested in is doing. So I'm a consumer and, yeah, it's not done great with the line endings there. Um, I'm a consumer and I'm interested in integrating with this contract. Um, with, sorry, integrating with this service. And, and this is the contract, this is the, the, the terms on which I want to integrate. So I'm saying this endpoint here, if I make a GET request to it, I should get a response, the 200 status, um, this header, JSON content type, and the body should have cities, and each one should, be, should have a name um, of type string and temperature of type number. So far, so almost looking a little bit like XML schema. But so one thing we can do, the obvious thing we can do is actually to use that contract, the, the, the date, the, this kind of 
reified data version of a contract and use it to generate some tests of that upstream service, which we can do. And if you see, kind of see up there, it passes. Fabulous. All right, great. We're, we're, we're doing well here. We've got a, a service that meets the requirements we need. So we're going to uh, use that now to make a simple weather dashboard. Here we are. Um, I'm not known for my UX skills, so this is quite an achievement for me. Um, <laughs> and, and we're consuming that, so we're consuming that feed, and we're putting a nice heads-up display, um, which we're updating periodically as the data changes. I'm also doing some fancy shading and colouring. That took about three hours to actually get to work. <laughs> uh, and I was like, why am I, why am I wasting time on this? Um, that's, yeah. uh, so, let, you know, I, I just kind of said, oh, look, it runs and it passes. That, that's fabulous. But, you know, that you, you, you don't have to believe me. Um, so one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to now break that contract. So I've changed that weather, I've changed the service, that upstream service. Now, there's a, there's a bug, or, or, or by, by kind of um, intentionally, they've removed the name from, from the cities. Um, and if we go back to the dashboard, it's kind of broken. Um, and the reason it's broken is because I'm not particularly good at checking for nulls, and I'm uppercasing that name, that name's not there. Boom. Right, service broken. Um, and if we wanted to maybe diagnose and figure out what was going wrong, we could re-verify against, so we're taking that contract that we got and verifying it against the upstream service. And again, it's not, it's not too clear this, these messages could be better, but it's saying, well, we expected you to have a name, to be non-nil on this object, it's not, so something's gone wrong. So immediately, it kind of gives you, if you're trying to fix why the, why the hell your, your application's broken, it just gives you it just gives you something to be able to just diagnose the, the, the most likely cause. Because if your code hasn't, you know, you're sitting there, your code hasn't changed, it's been running in isolation. If something suddenly goes wrong and you haven't touched it, it's probably, it's probably an outside party doing something funny. And in this case, it was. So I'm going to reset that again and just check it's all working again. Yep, so we're now back to a decent functioning service. Um, and there's obviously other things we can do to make it go wrong. I've now switched the content type to HTML instead of uh, JSON. Pretty fundamental change, and unsurprisingly, you get a whole heap of errors about the content type and stuff like that. Uh, there we are. I think we're back to normal now. Let's have a look. Yes. Cool. All right. But, you know, not all changes are bad. Um, I've now changed that service, and I've added on some more additional things about the Outlook. Um, if anyone knows Melbourne, that's actually true. It's, it's, it is a crazy place. It's like raining one day, then hot the next. Actually, raining one hour, hot the next hour. Um, the, so, so you're seeing there that, that actually it still, it still passes our test. Even though we've added that extra data in, even though we've popped in this extra data, it passes our test. And that's good, because also, our service is still able to consume that data. Uh, uh, sorry, our client application is still able to consume that data. So calling out to that live API might be expensive. It might be slow. It might cost money. There may be a minimum, you know, like you only make three requests an hour, stuff like that. So this is where the idea of simulating comes in. It's also, you know, it's also a very good way of actually running that contract and testing whether it works. So we just got a we, we just all the simulating the simulation does is takes that contract, a port, and some other bits of configuration, and then just sets it up running. So we can run that service, and it's taken that information that we've given it and said, "All right, so you want some cities, and <laughs> name's going to be a string, temperature's got to be a number." All right, cool. All right, there you go. It's yeah, you know, it's it's it's, it's done what you said. That's Computers aren't that smart. That's, that's kind of all they can do. Um, so we just, just attest that the, the circle is complete. If we run that verification again, it's all, it's all hitting the same port, makes it easier. Um, obviously, it passes the verification of the contract it's trying to simulate. Cool. Um, so let's go and look at that in the dashboard. Oh. It's, it's kind of, there's a, there's a few problems here. Um, Number one is that my lovely shading that, that shaded it from, like, compared to what color it is, has kind of broken because 
these numbers are either stupidly high or stupidly low. I don't know much about, you know, I'm not sure much about science. We were talking to some earth scientists this morning, they could have told me this, but I don't think you can get temperatures that high. <laughs> like, I, I don't know, it just seems, yeah, possibly not. Um, and also, if you notice, it's starting to kind of crawl a bit because we've not really applied any constraints to say, well, yeah, so you want a list of cities, but how many cities, you know, how many is too much? So I've actually set, to stop the thing breaking, I think it only just will, any list, it will kind of go between zero and a thousand um, items in that, in that list. It doesn't, it doesn't go crazy, because I, I had it up at like 65,000 and it broke my um, browser. <laughs> so so this, is, this, is where, uh, this is where I think the idea of a contract and, and, and starting to pull that out as an entity in its own right gets really interesting, because you start to think, uh, so what are, the what are the constraints of my system? What, 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 what's the limits of the data that I can accept before completely breaking stuff? Now, you can either make your code so it drops, say, you know, you're easily with the cities to just take the top three off that response and not worry. But another alternative is to set some constraints on the contract. So I've revised this contract now, and I've just added a couple more directives. So I've said length between zero and 10, and that name, that, that string name, should have a length between 5 and 20. I clearly think I'm writing JavaScript there because there's a comma. Um, and then we come to the number, and we're saying that really we expect a reasonable range of temperatures to between minus 1 and 45. Um, so we've, we've now applied some, some additional constraints to that contract that, that we didn't actually realize that, that we thought, we, you know, it's, until that went live and we started getting weird numbers out, we wouldn't have realized that constraints are an issue. So we can, if we just restart, we go back to the real, real service again, um, we, we rerun the contract, so this is running the one with, the, with, with the additional constraints, and obviously it passes, it's fine. Um, we can now pop up the simulator again, and, and it, it doesn't look that pretty, because it's still, it's using uh, the data generators, the, 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 the things that Test Generative uses to create lots of random strings and integers. Um, it doesn't look that great. I could have constrained what characters are there, but the temperatures look kind of right. Um, and already the dashboard starts to look a bit nicer. Um, it starts to reflect more what we saw when we were integrating the real service. So that whole exercise has allowed us to kind of narrow in on exactly what we need to, um, what, what, what stuff that this display, that this client application needed from the upstream service. So, you know, there was this implicit requirement for the temperature to be in a certain range um, that we didn't have in our contract. And now, using the simulator has kind of forced us to think about it. And I think that's kind of interesting. I, I like that because it's something that, you know, you can see it's applying arbitrary constraints, but that's, that, that's it's often, like I sometimes think as a, as a developer, I do sort of concentrate on what you call the happy path, right? You concentrate on things, data being nice and conveniently shaped. When you realize in the real world, you could, you could get anything. So it, I think it's anything that gets me to think about the constraints of where I'm working is all good. So I mentioned a little bit about consumer, consumer contracts, consumer driven contracts. Um, and as you saw there, all that contract stuff I was doing from the perspective of the consumer. Um, and that's, yeah, if you, you can read this article, that talks more about it, but um, it's kind of quite a good idea, or quite, a, quite an interesting, powerful idea. Like you, you, if you get the consumer to specify the contract, um, it reduces coupling, um, because you know, the, the consumer's now able to just say, I need that, 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 and that, and it's a lot more explicit what he needs. Um, and it kind of rebalances the power a little bit from the service and the consumer. So although, obviously, the service has the ultimate power because it's the one putting out the, you know, it's the one powering the API and, and controls what it does. The consumer is able to say, look, you know, I need you to do this. And it, taking it to its conclusion, you could end up in a situation where actually the service contract um, is not, you, you don't explicitly write that, it just becomes a union of consumer contracts. And you can imagine some crazy stuff with checking compatibility. Does this consumer contract match that consumer contract? It sounds like a fun problem. Um, Janice is obviously a work in progress. There's a few things we need to do. One is um, just using existing libraries more. So I've, you know, all that stuff is right. He's using its own checking stuff where there's all these test frameworks that do a far better job than we, could, we do of, of writing assertions. So trying to figure out a way of transforming a contract 
into assertions would be a really interesting thing. Um, and then the other directions we want to go is apply to more situations, different data formats, not just JSON. I understand there are other formats. Um, maybe looking at test, testing for other things in header caching directives. Quality of service would be cool. If you could test this service should return this data and it should respond within 20 minutes or 20 seconds, whatever your quality of service is. Um, and then perhaps going beyond HTTP, T, HTTP too. Um, as well as like applying to more situations, make contracts more useful too. Um, more nuanced simulation, there's so much more you can do there with state and returning sensible values. Uh, and then obviously extending out to monitoring documentation. So I'm kind of done now, but just a couple of puzzles and a couple of things, because I said getting smarter about web integration. Um, I didn't say that I have the answer, unfortunately, I'd, I'd love to. Um, and, the, and the first question I have is, do we need to have this kind of rarefied contract thing for every, every integration, for every line on this diagram? And the answer is, it kind of depends. Sorry, it's not, you know, there's no hard and fast rule. Um, it depends maybe on how important that integration is. Is it happening kind of in user time? Is it, it you know, when, when, when one of your when your, one of your customers is connecting to your website, does it hit this web service? Is someone going to die or lose something if, if it goes wrong? Um, how reliable is that upstream service as well? So, you know, does it go wrong a lot? Do you need to kind of add this in just to help you out? How easy is it to figure out when stuff goes wrong and how often do things change? If things don't change ever, maybe you don't need to have a contract. It's, it's, you know, it's there, it's working. If things are changing, like, rapidly, again, that, that's too much overhead, but there's maybe a sweet spot in the middle where this approach makes sense. Do we need a standard contract definition language? A wisdom for the HTTP age? Um, no, I don't think so. I'm, I'm not, I'm, my personal opinion, I don't, I'm not sure standards are that helpful for what we're wanting to do. I want us to focus on talking about contracts again, getting kind of, getting over the trauma of, of wisdom and like starting to just, you know, let, 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 let's start the conversation, let's, let's build tools that work with contracts, however we decide to represent them. I don't think we can all agree. We all can't agree on what a good tasting cup of coffee is. We're certainly not going to agree on what contracts look like. That's my opinion, but you may have others. So when I said um, the Internet of Strings, it was a, quite a, just a punished um, talk title. Um, but you know, one question I've had is, well, do you want to just apply structure to everything? Is it, is it about taming things and making things consistent and predict, predictable? Um, but that kind of top-down, applying constraints from top-down, adding this, this structure to this like, lovely, wonderful, chaotic system that, you know, is, is, is kind of amazing, and I just would feel that's not my goal. For a start, it's impossible, and it's also just not, yeah, it's not in the spirit of things. Um, my real goal, though, is to, to recognize, what we need to do is recognize that con those contracts exist, whether we like them or not. There are services that are integrating together and have these implicit contracts, and I want to turn these contracts that are fuzzy and unknowable and confusing into something real and tangible and something we can start to reason about. And if we do that, we create tools to make our lives easier. Um, it allows us to focus on doing more interesting stuff, having more dangerous ideas, and making more dangerous architectures. So thank you for listening to my rambles.